Hello, everybody, and welcome to this next video in the um, Charles Bukowski chapbook um, playlist. There's probably a better way to say that. I just, yeah, I don't know. Okay, this one is um, a bit tricky to get through. Um, and I'll explain some stuff to you in a minute here. But today we're going over a signature of Charles Bukowski from <clears throat> um, the little magazine Targets, number four from 1960. One thing that um, I don't know if people are aware of, um, a lot of little magazines or zines or um, littles, like whatever you want to call them, um, like something along the lines of um, when I was doing M Zine or Weird Mask or um, there was another one, oh, the Time Mazine, things like that. Um, a lot of times what some publishers of these little things would do would be to, um, like you have like, I don't know, let's say you have th 32 pages is a very average size for a, a, a side staple or saddle staple or saddle stitched um, little magazine. Um, it's good in the sense of how much it costs to ship because doing something like that and that would be kind of like this yeah this is a 32 page so this right here sending something like this um would cost probably now a little bit more but usually this is um enough for a first class postage stamp Anything above this, you're having to start adding postage to it. So that's a pretty good size. So what um, some of these people would do when making these magazines, like Target's number four, is like if a 32-page booklet here um, means it's eight pieces of paper. So it's basically eight pieces of paper, like normal printer paper, let's say. Okay. So usually the cover is considered one sheet of those eight pages. So then that leaves you seven pages left. <clears throat> when they would do a detachable chapbook or um, an included chapbook in these, usually that meant that um, three of those pages are going to have other people's stuff in it. And then four of those pages would be the included chapbook. Okay. So, um, and some people did it differently where, um, the, everything was stapled together. Some would do it to where, um, the magazine itself had, two staples but the chapbook had one staple some would be um the magazine would be stapled and the chapbook would be stitched i don't know there's like all different ways anyone could have done it and so this one a signature of charles bukowski is in targets number four which is why the um cover of this has nothing to do with bukowski it's just here you go there is a lot of speculation as to how many of these were actually published. Um, different sources have different things, but um, basically there were a bunch published inside the magazine. And then there were some that were published without the magazine. And I don't know what these were for. I don't know if these were just given to Bukowski. I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know. As low as six and as high as like 24 copies that I think were not in the chat book or were not in the Targets 4. And then Targets 4 
I have no idea how many they could have made. Um, I would guess anywhere in between 50 and 100, maybe 200, um, depending on... It was a quarterly thing. So um, now this might not seem important, and it probably isn't, but I don't know where else I'm going to be able to have this conversation with anybody. So again, if you go to uh, Bukowski.net, it's a great resource. If you go to um, the Bukowski forums which are still there, but you can't add anything new to them now. Like, they're just there for posterity, I think. Um, But, I mean, the guys over there are way smarter than me, have way more knowledge, way more research, years under them. Um, And they really... Like, if I ever have a Bukowski question about anything, I just spend some time over there okay so this collection from 1960 is from december 1960 um conversation on a telephone ashes gambler o hermit in the city home from a room below the plains pull me through the temples pull me through the wine horse on fire and the tragedy of the leaves so we have eight poems in here that actually makes sense if each of these poems could fit on a single Um, page since there are eight no four so one two three four five six seven eight yeah okay so this is all making sense i have never seen um, a copy of targets number four i tried looking online um for prices for targets number four couldn't find it um there are allegedly two copies in the um it's not the library it's the book collection or whatever of uc santa barbara so um i have a feeling a lot of the things that i'm going to be looking for are up there so i'm probably going to have to make a pilgrimage if you will um up there and try to look it's not that far and look through this stuff because there are some questions I have, but, um, a couple things that, um, came up that, um, I wanted to show you guys is stuff I found on the Bukowski forum. So why not show it to you? A, so here we have, um, the Albuquerque Tribune, January 3rd, 1961. Okay. Cause this came out in December of 1960. Poetry Magazine published here. The fourth issue of Targets, a quarterly of modern poetry published in Albuquerque, has been released. The 32-page magazine... Oh, good, it was 32 pages. um, Contains the work of 15 poets and features a folder of poems by Charles Bukowski of Los Angeles. New Mexico poets represented are Lloyd Alpo of Albuquerque, Robert Rhodes of Tome, and Judson Cruz of Taos. W. L. Garner is editor and publisher of the Quarterly. That's a neat little little blurb you got there. The next thing I wanted to talk about is this, which is a letter from Charles Bukowski to um, Mr. W.L. Garner and also Lloyd Alpo. I wonder if that's how you say that, Alpo or Alpa. Alpa. Okay, Los Angeles, California, almost 61. Okay, so this is, again... This came out in December. This is almost 61. That ma- that newspaper article was 61. So we, we see what's happening here. Um, dear W.L. Garner and Lloyd Alpo, Thank you for the many targets for, of which I will distribute a dozen and a half to people who are alive in the literary sense of or who are simply alive without being writers, painters, etc. 
I will keep a few copies for the future and some for myself. Old Ez will probably spit out his teeth when he reads Horse on Fire, but even the great can sometimes live in error, and it is up to us smaller ones to correct their table manners. And Sherry Martinelli will wail, but why did they blubber over their precious canto and then tell me about it. I am a dangerous man when turned loose with a typewriter. Hmm? Hmm? Fuck. <clears throat> the other poems have held up well, it seems to me. You know, I write very badly at times because I do not rework my stuff. But here, the poems appear strong. And I hope I do not appear too out of the way and saying I have been honored by this special targets issue and while I'm at it I like the piquette drawings mucho and the whole setup the print the layout beautifully neat well before I get like gramps and blubber over my own poems I'm getting out of here truly Charles Bukowski. That is such an interesting letter and um, probably one of the best lines of forever. I am a dangerous man when turned loose with a typewriter. Fuck me, dude. All right. So anyway, <clears throat> with that said, um, we can get into this. Now, again, I told you there were eight poems in this book. There is a problem. Only four of them I have access to. I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried to find the rest. And I just couldn't do it. <clears throat> so there are a couple things here. One, there have been so many collections of Bukowski stuff over the years. So many books. That it's almost safe to say, and I said almost safe to say. It's almost safe to say that um, if these are not included there's a in anything, there's a good chance that they're probably not very good. There's a good chance of that. Um, is that like a definite thing? No. It's just there's a good possibility that they're not very good. So what we have here, we have conversation on a telephone. We have Hermit in the City. Horse on Fire, and The Tragedy of the Leaves. The other poems in here, I can't find. <clears throat> um, now, there are a few things here. So, the second poem in here, Ashes, um, it said this was written um, circa 1960. There is a possibility that this poem, Ashes, is the same poem as... Um, I Taste the Ashes of Your Death from Flower Fist and Bestial Whale, the first one we did. Just because, um, as you will see, if there's a poem that, whether he likes or something, at, and he thinks this is like his immortal poem, he'll start like pushing that through to more people. And it's very strange because people say, well, what's Bukowski's best poem? Like, what's one of his biggest poems? And I think a lot of this, it, it's not up to the people. It's up to, like, Bukowski and how much he pushed a certain poem onto certain people. And we will see some examples of that in a bit here. Um, but with Ashes, I, I can't be um, positive that that's what happened. That's going to be my guess. Um, and it's just the same, or it could be the same poem with a different name, as happened sometimes. But again, until I see the actual contents of this book, I will never know that. Um, Gambler O. Now this one, if you go on to the um, uh, Bukowski.net, and click on this poem, it has the beginning of it, like, up here. And this, again, this is the only place this ever was. Now, I will 
read it to you this. Notice, if you will, the neat and slobbering hill, the past perfect, the... Thank you. The emperor born eccentric is pure as an electric casket and cast down on corn. Um, so, first off, he he's doing a little bit of rhyming in here, and he hates rhyming. Um, oh, it's not gambler, it's gambier. Oh, I didn't notice, I thought that was an L. Okay, well, I got the title of it wrong, too. That's probably why I was having such a hard time finding it. Oh, um, but yeah, so it doesn't sound like something that was really his style. It might have just been something he had. Um, I have no idea. Um, Hermit in the City, we will go over. Home from a room below the plains does not have any um, beginning to it. And pull me through the temples and pull me through the wine. Um, th this has a little bit here. It says... The sun borns us and burns us down. Like a candle, music loves hunchbacks. The black birds whirl outside my window pane. Grass goes grass, shoe shine shine. Um, again, um, this is, this to me, sounds more like him trying to impress people than what he will um, eventually be doing a lot of. Now, the flip side to all this is that the poems that we do have access to in here, um, more so than Flower Fist and Bestial Will, I think these poems are very much what Bukowski would really lean into as his career goes. So, um, the first one, Conversation on a Telephone. That is in The Days Run Away um, Like Wild Horses Over the Hills. It's also in the original 1962 Run with the Hunted. Um, it's in On Cats. And as far as the recordings go, it's in the Bukowski Tapes from 87 VHS, the Bukowski Tapes 2006 DVD, and the Poetry of Charles Bukowski CD um, from 2008. This is, to me kind of an important poem conversations on a telephone here because this might be and I'm not sure about this but this might be it, at least in his published stuff I'm pretty confident I could be wrong um, but this might be the first published Bukowski poem about cats and if there's anyone out there who knows more than I do um hit me um and i probably could just look at the on cats book and find out but um yeah here we are so um conversation on a telephone <clears throat> i could tell by the crouch of the cat the way it was flattened that it was insane with prey and when my car came upon it it rose in the twilight and made off with a bird in mouth a very large bird, gray, the wings down like broken love, the fangs in, life still there, but not much, not very much. The broken love bird, the cat walks in my mind, I cannot make him out. The phone rings, I answer a voice, but I see him again and again, and those loose wings, those loose gray wings. And this thing held in a head that knows no mercy. It is the world. It is ours. I put the phone down and the cat sides of the room come in upon me. And I would scream. But they have places for people who scream. And the cat walks. The cat walks forever in my brain. Now, <clears throat> one thing I will say about this cat poem compared to his other cat poems is that um, most of his cat poems, he is talking in a way where cats are these magnificent creatures that he's almost jealous of or in awe of. 
that they can do what they want, move around with so much class and so much style and not give a fuck. Um, but in this, he's like fucking um, kind of terrified. And he goes in his house and he's the he, phone rings. He answers it. Someone's talking to him, but he can't fucking concentrate because he just saw the the brutality of the world um, through the actions of this cat eating a bird. Um, so that that's just fucking excellent. Um, I like that one a lot. Again, when I was saying like the poems that we have here are very indicative of what his career will end up taking. So um, that is how that works. Hermit in the City. Um, this is in here. Now this one is not one of my favorites. Um, it's a little um, vague, um, a little drab. Um, it's okay, but... Um, he will do much better um, poems about kind of being isolated in within four walls, looking out on um, a living, breathing city that's probably going to um, destroy him if he's not careful. So those are the poems from the signature Charles Bukowski that are in The Days Run Away. So now I want to talk about um, Horse on Fire because that letter I wrote, or not I wrote, the letter I read um, earlier to the um, editor of this little magazine. He talks about how old Ez um, is going to like spit his teeth out and Sherry Martinelli. Now if you don't know, let me go get it. Beer Spit, Night, and Cursing, the correspondence of Charles Bukowski and Sherry Martinelli from 1960 through 1967. Now, what's strange about this is that this poem was written in 1960. Um, it came out at the very end of 1960. So, um, the hub bub and shit that he is speaking of is probably in here and I wonder if I wonder if I could actually find it. Is there an index in here? Oh my god there is. Okay. Okay so he says here that um, all poems out, nothing on hand, nothing boiling I'm in the autumn epos will be in the winter also present um, Kega Targets has given me eight pages in the winter issue, and I have sent him a bucket of poems to narrow down on. Okay, so that's him talking about him sending those poems out. <laughs> and I'll get to the poem in a second here. This is just too much. Okay, so 154. She probably never read it. Let's see. <gasps> no. Okay. Maybe she did. Okay, Sherry, enclosed copies. So this is um, early December in 1961. I mean early January 61. Okay, so early January 61. Oh my god, this is so funny. Some technicals. The signature section is a portion of a larger target's number four, of which I'm enclosing a copy with the others. Gardner had a batch of SIG sections printed, however, and sent me a good helping. Okay, so he sends her the the book. Okay, what, what else do we got here? 158. Okay, so here we go. Oh my god. Okay, so this is her writing him. No, not really mad about Horse on Fire. If one took you to task about it in A&P, pray don't mind that it'd ruin you if Martinelli praised you. 
I sent your target with the signature alone to Laughlin that one I meant at St. Liz. Okay, so she's not pissed off about it. I think he was trying to make a bigger deal about it than it was. That's kind of a letdown. I was hoping for some juicy gossip. But the funny thing about that is, is that that's so Bukowski to convince a publisher that by them printing something that you have given them, it's going to generate a lot of heat. And that heat would probably turn into sales. So that cracks me up. So now that we have evidence that Bukowski thought people would get mad and then he sends it to them personally to just fucking antagonize. It's so funny that he would fucking send it. I didn't know that he just, like, here, take a look at this. What a fucking funny motherfucker. Jesus Christ. Okay. I'm probably the only one cracking up right now. Okay, so anyway, so this is in the Rooming House Madrigals Early Selected Poems. Okay, um, horse on fire. Bring, bring straight things like a horse on fire. Ezra said, write it so as a man on the west coast of Africa could understand it. And he proceeded to write the cantos, full of dead languages, newspaper clippings, and love scenes from St. Liz. Bring, bring straight things in bird light. The terror of a mouse, grass arms, great stone heads, and reading Canto 90. He put the paper down, as did. Both their eyes were wet, and he told her, among the greatest love poems ever written. Ezra, there are many kinds of traitors of which the political are the least, but self-appraisal of poetry and love has proved more fools than rebels. Now, besides all that other shit about the letter and Sherry Martinelli, um, and again, if you don't know, Sherry Martinelli um, allegedly uh, was Ezra Pound's lover and um, a bunch of the poems in the cantos were written about her. So... In this poem, he's basically saying, which is weird because some of the way he does it is vague, but like he he wants his poetry to be straight and to the point, okay? And when the cantos, okay, for those of you who have not read it, um, I have tried to read it and it fucking bores the fuck out of me. So... If um, anyone that out there is like, oh yeah, the Cantos is great, then cool. Long story short, he's being a snarky, witty fucker blasting his heroes, okay? So this also is something that we will see a lot more of as his career progresses. And not just blasting his heroes, but blasting the art scene, blasting poets, blasting poetry in general. Um, so that's a really neat touch in this book. Um, so there's that. And then finally, we have the last poem here, The Tragedy of the Leaves. Now, The Tragedy of the Leaves, when um, people ask, what's Bukowski's best poem? Like, you know how I was talking about this a little while ago. Um the Tragedy of the Leaves is probably uh, probably his best early poem, um, I would say. I would say. Um, but again, he probably thought it was an immortal poem that he did, and that's fine because it's pretty fucking good. The second thing is, is that if there is any immortality to the tragedy of the leaves it's because of how much he pushed it to everybody so like um a lot of these poems were in like maybe one other book and that's it tragedy of the leaves is also in long shot poems for bro players which is um another chapbook that's coming up um in 1961 
it's in It Catches My Heart in Its Hands in 1963. And that was kind of like his first like bigger book um, that Lujan Press put out. Um, it's in a Bukowski sampler from 1969. It's in Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame, because it was in It Catches Its Heart in My Hands. It Catches My Heart in Its Hands. Um, and then it was in the Run with the Hunted 1993 version, which is not the same as the other one that I'm talking about. Um, the Pleasures of the Damned in 2007 and The Essential Charles Bukowski in 2016. But it's also in this issue of Targets. It was in The Outsider number 3 in 1963. It was in Florida Education, Volume 42, number 9 from May 1965. It was in Z, an anthology of revolutionary poetry from 1968. Um, California Bicentennial Poets Anthology in 76. And then as far as the recordings go, it was in the Bukowski Tapes VHS from 87 at Terra Street and Agony Way from 1998. Um... Bukowski Reads His Poetry from 2004, the Bukowski Tapes DVD from 2006, and Poetry of Bukowski from 2008. Um, so, <clears throat> this is one that is everywhere. And um, I'm pretty confident that most best of collections would have this poem in it. Okay. So, um, here we go. The tragedy of the leaves. I awakened to dryness and the ferns were dead. The potted plants yellow as corn. My woman was gone. And the empty bottles like bled corpses surrounded me with their uselessness. The sun was still good, though. And my landlady's note cracked in fine and undemanding yellowness. What was needed now was a good comedian ancient style a jester with jokes upon absurd pain pain is absurd because it exists nothing more i shaved carefully with an old razor the man who had once been young and said to have had and said to have genius but that's the tragedy of the leaves the dead ferns the dead plants and I walked into a dark hall where the landlady stood, execrating and final, sending me to hell, waving her fat, sweaty arms and screaming, screaming for rent because the world had failed us both. Execrating. Yes, I think that's correct. Okay. So, there are... Um, there's some cool shit in here. There is one bit that I think I would have taken out. But again, I'm not Bukowski. Um, but, like, just this whole thing. Like... The... The showing of other things to show the lapse of time. So, like... Everything was dry. The plants were dead. They were yellow as corn. Um, there were empty bottles everywhere. Like, bled corpses um, surrounded me with their uselessness. And his woman was gone. Okay? So, he's heartbroken. He's been fucking laying around drunk. Um, the plants have all died because she was the one who probably took care of him. The whole thing. Um, and then it goes back to it and then probably the thing that a lot of people really enjoy about this poem or the line people like was that um, the landlady stood waving her fat sweaty arms and screaming for rent because the world had failed us both um, that's one of those lines that um, when you hear people talk about Bukowski they really dig a lot okay so next time since that was honestly um, the end of 1960 we're going to go to 1961 
and we're going to do Signature 2, which was um, also published in Targets Magazine. And this one only has three poems in it. Um, 3.30 a.m. Conversation, The Elephant, and The Sheet. And let me just see... Okay, so that's in Rooming House. Let me see if I'm going to be able to find all these, actually. Okay, The Elephant is only in that. And The Sheet is only in that. So we'll see if I have um, better luck tracking down those two poems um, before next time. Okay? So I hope this was informative. I hope this was fun. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Um, and if you have any questions, let me know. If I got things wrong, tell me because I don't know everything, God damn it. And um, let me know. So until next time, um, wubba wubba wubba, goodbye and God bless. So bye-bye. <laughs>